All right, Psalm 122. I'm going to focus in on that first verse that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We ought to be happy to come to church. I know I, oftentimes it doesn't show. I'm not the type of person to always show my excitement outwardly. But I am excited for our church. I'm, I'm excited that we're doing what we're doing and that, um, you know, we're, we're just starting from scratch and trying to reach people. And I am very glad to go into the house of the Lord. Now, obviously, we're in the Old Testament. He's talking about the temple, talking about the house of the Lord um, or the tabernacle even because. Um, but in any case. In the New Testament, the local church is the is the the pillar and ground of the truth, and um, oftentimes we refer to this as the house of the Lord, and we ought to be happy and excited and looking forward to going to church. Now, that being said, turn if you would to Romans sixteen. Church is extremely important. Church is one of the most important things that that you should be participating in in your life. It's a place where we come to learn. It's a place where you gather together with other like-minded believers. It's a place where you, where you can grow closer to and, and establish relationships with other believers in Jesus Christ and to build friendships and, and to build that, the, the bond of, of a brother and sister's relationship within the body of Christ. And um, it's extremely, it's also a place where you come to learn. It's a place where we come where we can all sing together praises unto our Lord and our Savior and give thanks unto His name where we could edify each other and, and just know about what's going on with people and to grow and, and to stick together and, and be comforted and be strengthened. All these things happen with it, with, within church. It should be a place that you look forward to going to. It's not just some drudgery. It's not, oh man, we've got church again. And, you know, I could preach this especially for me and my family because, you know, we're right now we're meeting out of my house and it shouldn't be oh man, we've got church again. Oh, I've got to get the house clean or, or oh, we've got so much extra work to do. It should be a joyous thing. We ought to have our hearts right with God to say, I'm happy that we're going to have church tonight and, and you know, have that type of an outlook. And regardless of if, you know, my family is a little bit unique because we're meeting here, but it doesn't matter where you're meeting or who you are. We all ought to be looking forward to coming to church, to hearing God's word preached, to see what new things we could learn, what changes we could make in our life, you know, the, the people, what's going on in people's lives, and um, be excited about serving the Lord. And um, if you're in Romans 16, I'm going to go through a list of things that we need to be ready for because, because church is so important, we need to be ready when we come to church. It's something that you should treat as not just something you check off the list as, oh yeah, I went to church today, but that it's, it's, it's something that you go as a place to do m many things. And one of the things that you need to be ready to do when you go to church is to be ready to greet people in the fellowship. And these are in no particular order. I'm going to go through multiple things that we do at church that you need to be participating in and be ready to do and why it's so important. Now, if you're in Romans 16, there's this whole list of, uh, of people that Paul is talking about greeting and saluting in Romans 16. And one of the most basic things about church is, is a place where we gather together with like-minded believers. And church shouldn't just be a place where you come in and you sit down and you're just here to hear the preaching and then you get up and you leave. That's not what church is all about. That's only one of the things, and we're going to get to that a little bit later, of that aspect of church. But one of the very important things is, like I was just mentioned, to build the relationships within the church, to be there for each other, to strengthen, to edify, and to, to build up other Christians. It's important to be greeting people. We have visitors come in and members and everybody. We should, we should be a very friendly church and get to know one another and be able to greet people by name. Uh, Romans 16 verse 3 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. 
who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Adr Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute As Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now this is one list of people that Paul is mentioning. Say, hey, greet this person, salute this person. And in order to know people by names, obviously you get to know them a little bit. You, you, you know, if you meet somebody one time, you're probably not going to know them very well enough to, to, when you're writing a letter like he was here to the Romans, to call out all of these people and say, hey, salute this person, greet this person, see how they're doing. You know, and, and it's not even just him. He's saying, you go, you know, greet these people, salute them. Um, keep up these relationships. These are all fellow laborers or all fellow workers. And um, Paul, he cares about these people. He's thinking about these people enough to mention them by name. We ought to be building these types of relationships and greeting the people when they come into church and, and getting to know them. And when you're away, ask about them and, and see how they're well doing. Or think about people. Pray for people. We ought to be looking out for each other in the church. This is one of the, the one very key aspect of coming to church. That's why you know the church is more than just hearing the sermon preach. It's about getting to know everybody in the church, and um, that's why one of the reasons why it's a sin. You know, people think they're at church when they sit at home and watch the TV because they watch some TV preacher, or they sit at home on the internet and listen to a sermon preach and think that that's church. That's not church. You're missing a huge aspect of church, which is getting to know the local congregation and your brothers and sisters in Christ and getting to know them well enough to, for one, work with them, labor with them. Paul's talking about how many of these people here, you know, our helper who bestowed much labor on us, who are of note, you know, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, people who are doing the work of Christ. Paul's asking about all these people because he got to know them, because they worked together, they labored together in the church. Another aspect of church that we need to become ready for, not just ready to greet people and, and to fellowship with them, we need to be ready to sing. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. But I'll read from you from Psalm 149, verse 1 says, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation, in the congregation of saints. Now, I believe we ought to sing to God in our personal lives. We ought to sing praises unto his name at various times, you know, either throughout the day, throughout our week, individually. But specifically in church is, is a place to sing praises unto the Lord, which is why we sing praises unto the Lord, which is why we sing congregational singing. That's another reason why we don't just have special music of people coming up and singing for us and we just sit there. Um, when the Bible says, praise ye the Lord, ye is plural. He's talking to, to a, a multitude of people, not just one. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. In the congregation, in the gathering. When we gather together, we need to be singing the songs. And you might say, well, I don't sing very well. It doesn't put a condition on here, well, unless, unless you don't sing very well. God wants to hear your voice. When you come to church, we ought to come ready to sing. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 11. We looked at this on Wednesday night when I preached on Jesus Christ, the Word being made flesh. 
Hebrews 2, look at verse number 11. It says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is talking about Christ. He's the one who sanctified who sanctifieth, and we're the ones that are sanctified. It says that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And then he quotes the Old Testament of where Jesus is calling us brethren in verse number 12 of Hebrews 2, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So here we see when Jesus is referring to us as brethren about singing praise unto God in the midst of the church. Church is a place for singing songs. We all need to be ready to do that. And, you know, if singing isn't your thing, you need to get over that because it's something that one of the things that we ought to do to bring glory unto God's name. Another thing we need to be ready for when you come to church ready, don't just come ready to greet and fellowship and ready to sing, but come ready to listen. We need to, to, to get your focus right in church. Okay, you need to come when you come to church and it's time for the learning, when it's time for the, the sermon to be preached, you need to be ready to listen. You need to be ready to hearken unto the word of God. The time for talking, the time for fiddling on your gadgets, on your phones, that all needs to go away. It, that all needs to go away when you come into church to begin with. But especially during the, the preaching, during the reading of God's word and the expounding of God's word, you need to come ready to listen. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. Now, how many times in the, in the New Testament can you remember what Jesus Christ said? You know, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. You know, they that have ears to hear, let him hear. We need to be listening and have our ears opened up. So when you come to church, you need to try to get all the distractions out of your mind. There's a lot of things that go on in our busy lives. You know, when it sometimes you might even be getting hungry. You might be thinking, oh man, what am I going to have for lunch? Or you might be thinking about some work you were just doing before church or some work you have to go do after church or some other events going on in your life. We need to be able to push all those distractions out of our mind so that we're ready and prepared to listen. We need to make sure that we're ready for these things. It's important. Ezekiel chapter 44 Look at verse number 5. Ezekiel 44 verse 5 says, And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all the laws thereof. And mark well the entering in of the house with every going forth of the sanctuary. So God was saying here, He says, you need to hear with your ears all that I say unto thee concerning all of the ordinances. God's word is important. Every word of God is pure. And Jesus Christ said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You don't want to miss anything when you're in church. You want to hear every word that you can. You want to hear every word of God because they're all important. Flip back a little bit further if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. One more verse about hearing, about being ready to listen in church. Deuteronomy 5 verse 1 says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day that ye may learn them and keep and do them. So he's saying, okay, when Moses got all Israel together, we got the congregation together, and he was going to teach Israel what they needed to know, he says, hear, O Israel, listen up. The statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears this day, you need to be listening to them. They're important. They're from God. These are God's judgments. These are God's statutes. We need to keep them. He says, here that you may learn them. You're not going to be able to learn God's word if you're not listening. You're not going to be able to learn the things that you need to learn if your ears aren't open and ready to hear. Now part of being ready to hear and being ready to listen is going to involve having your heart prepared and your heart softened up. 
oftentimes people come in and we have, you know, you might have a, a preconceived idea already built up in your mind or your heart might be hardened and you're not ready to receive God's word. Let me give you an example that, you know, we, we like preaching. I like to preach hard on sin because it's important in order to make changes in our lives. Sometimes you need to hear your sins railed against from the pulpit. You need to hear God's word expounded on that area of your life that you need to change. And we have a tendency to be resistant to this change because your flesh is saying, no, I want to cling to this sin that I have in my life. I want to cling. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to hear the truth. But we need to come and have your hearts ready and have a humble spirit to be able to receive God's word and enough to be able to say, you know what, I'm wrong in this area and I need to change. It takes humility to admit that you're wrong about something. It takes humility to admit that, that you've sinned. That what you're doing, yes, that actually is a sin. And that you don't have a justification or an excuse for what you've done. If it's in the Bible, it is what it is, and it says what it says. Um, a good example of this would be, um, you know, a lot of people get upset when they hear the teaching about w when Jesus Christ calls marriage after a person is divorced is adultery. Okay, it's a clear teaching from the Bible. And one of the reasons why people don't like to hear that is because so many people are divorced these days. And that applies to them specifically. So that when they hear something like that, they don't want to hear that. That's not good news for them. Maybe they've already gotten remarried, or maybe they're looking to get remarried. And they don't want to hear that news that says, well, I've already been divorced. Now I, you know, I, I can't get remarried or else that's considered adultery in God's eyes. Because you vow to vow, that says, until death you do part. And I'm not going to preach a whole sermon about, about adultery and about divorce and remarriage, but Jesus Christ was very clear about that. And that is, that is not debatable. But what happens is people don't come into church ready to hear, ready to listen. We need to understand. Now, look, if something is said that's just not biblical, then, of course, you don't have to receive it. But you have to be able to take it in enough to be able to judge whether what's being said is true and right or not. And what happens is oftentimes people aren't ready to hear about their specific sins preached on. They come into church and they're not ready to hear those things. So what happens right away, they get defensive. Their defenses go up and they stop their ears. And remember, that's exactly what the people did that hated Jesus Christ and they hated Stephen. When Stephen was preaching about Christ, he was preaching that sermon and they, they stopped their ears and they ran on him in one accord because they couldn't handle to hear the truth. Now, those people were not saved and they did not want to hear anything about what, what Stephen had to say. But as Christians coming to church... You ought not to be like that at all. You ought to be ready to hear and ready to listen and ready to learn. The reason why we need to be ready to listen, to hear, is so that we can learn the Bible. And if you're in Deuteronomy 5, flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Because church is a place to learn God's word. That doesn't mean you don't learn God's Word at home. You should be doing even more learning at home. You should be reading the Bible on your own every single day of your life. But what we're talking about tonight is the house of the Lord. We're talking about church. We need to be ready in church. We need to be ready to, to hear, to listen, to greet people, to fellowship, to sing praises unto God. But we need to be ready to learn. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. And one other point, you know, in order to be ready to learn, what are we learning? We're learning God's Word. We're learning the Bible. Well, in order to learn God's Word, you ought to have your Bible with you. Okay? When we learn the Bible, you ought to have one with you. Bring it with you. Uh, we, we have some here at the church. If you don't have one, we'll provide it for you. But keep the word with you when it's time to learn and follow along in this book. It's important that you turn to these passages and you can see it for yourself. You should never get yourself in the habit of just 
relying on what the pastor says for everything. You say, well, the pastor wouldn't lie. That's true. Okay, I'm not going to you know, deceive you or, 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 or do you wrong, but that, that's not the point. You need to know for yourself. You need to see. There's something about reading the scripture for yourself, seeing it with your own eyes that helps it sink into your heart a little bit better than just hearing it out of some man's mouth because there's always that possibility you can give yourself the excuse that, you know, oh, he misinterpreted that or he said something wrong. And what I like to do, I've been in many churches. Um, we've been traveling. We've been out of town and visited many places. And oftentimes you'll hear preaching. And, you know, and, and I'll do the same thing because there's only so much time to preach. And, um, you know, I pull out certain verses that, that I think are applicable to what I'm trying to teach. But when I was sitting in church, what I like to do is, if only one verse is turned to or, or two verses, I like to read in context what that chapter is talking about just to make sure that it really is applicable to what I'm hearing. So oftentimes when the, when the pastor would have me turn to a place, I'll keep reading. Because, hey, for one, the pastor is only human as well. A pastor can make a mistake. And I, I've heard plenty of verses get misapplied over in, in general, in my day of going to various churches and stuff, where you know, oftentimes a preacher has a certain idea that they want to get across that sometimes doesn't even come from the Bible. Sometimes it does, but either way, they just go and try to use verses to support that. Which is, I mean, it, it happens all the time. Think about the, the, the cults out there, the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and just all kinds of people who believe in, in different things. They'll all give you some kind of a Bible verse to try to support their point of view. But what happens is the, vast, the, the ones that are teaching false doctrine, what they've done is they've ripped it out of context. And they try to make the Bible say something that it doesn't. So for you sitting down in the pews, you need to be looking at your Bibles and reading along and making sure that what's being used to, as supporting evidence is being used appropriately. It's being used the way that it ought to be. So one of the things that I've always done was just continue to read around that section that we're, that we're being taught, that, that is being referred to. But if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 31, oh, and one other point along the same lines of bringing your Bible, open it up, follow along, turn to those scriptures, okay? Don't just rely, first of all, don't just rely on your own memory. There's been plenty of times that I've talked about the Bible without actually going to the Bible and have found myself mistaken or other people mistaken. Your memory, every, you know, sometimes it may not be, especially when you're talking about something specific, it may not be that accurate. It's way more important just to turn it up, if you don't, it, especially if you don't have the Bible memorized, to turn to the place and say, oh wait, this is exactly what the, what the book says. Um, when you're having those conversations, Obviously, in the, with the preaching, it's not a conversation. You're hearing the word preach, but it's all the same reason that you need to go and verify this stuff for yourself. Not only that, there's children in church. There's other people looking around. Maybe there's some new Christians. Maybe you've been in church for a long time, and you say, well, I could recognize the passages, and I know where that is in the Bible, and I can tell if that's in context or not because I've read the Bible so much. You still ought to be turning in your book, in your Bible, along with everyone else, because part of the reason is other people are going to be kind of looking around and seeing what you do. People who aren't used to going to church, children who are growing up in church, if they see a whole bunch of people, just no one's ever turning to their Bibles, in their Bibles to the verses that we look at, why are the children going to turn to the verses when they grow up? They're going to say, oh, well, this is what everybody else did, so I'm not going to look. And who knows what church they're going to be in when they get older. It's a good habit to form, to, look, to, to get into the right verses, to turn to them and to look at them and to follow along when the, when the Bible study is going on. Many reasons for that. But if you're in Deuteronomy 31, look at verse number 11. It says, When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. 
and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. One of the purposes of being in church is to hear God's laws, to hear the Bible, hear the words of the Lord, and we need to learn to fear God. We need a healthy fear of the Lord because God will chasten and chastise every son whom he receiveth. He'll see the scourge every son whom he receiveth. And we want to make sure that we're not chastised, that we're not disciplined by God because we're ignorantly going out and sinning. We need to learn God's word. We need to listen and learn and um, fear the Lord our God and observe to do all the words that he has for us today. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll see an example from the New Testament. The New Testament gives us examples of how the church, 1 Corinthians 14 especially, tells us how the church ought to be operated, how things need to be run decently and in order. Um, well, I'm not going to read the part about people speaking with other tongues, but, but 1 Corinthians 14 goes over that and establishes that, you know, if there's that it shouldn't just be a bunch of people standing up and if you know if, if people want have something that they think that they need to add a word or revelation something that God has given them you know it, it's not a circus we don't just have a bunch of people standing up and preaching first Corinthians 14 kind of goes over that a little bit but we're going to jump in to verse number 29 it says let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by let the first hold his peace for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. So when the, when the, when the preaching time is going on, when, when um, the prophet gets up, or the preacher gets up and they're preaching, you know, if there's multiple preachers, well, we're going to do it one at a time, one by one. They're going to be able to get up and preach God's word. It's going to be done decently. It's going to be done in order. It says that all may learn so that we can all learn at church and we may all be comforted during the time of the preaching. Jump down to verse 34. This is still in context of being in church because this is also important during the learning time, which is the time when the preaching is going on, the expounding of God's word. God's word, verse 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. This is a New Testament church. This isn't the Old Testament. Talking about how a church ought to be run. It says that the women are to keep silence. It is not permitted. Per women do not have permission to be speaking during the learning time of church. It says to be, they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So in verse 35, it's referring to the learning time. So is it a time for a woman in church to raise their hand and ask a question during the preaching so that they could understand, they could learn more? The Bible says no. The Bible says it's a shame for women to speak in the church. If you're going to learn anything, if you have questions about it, he says, ask your husband at home. One of the, one of the, another place here that, that's talking about the husband being the head of the household and not only just the the um, hierarchical head, but he should be the spiritual leader as well. The men should be able to, to teach their wives and their children God's word. That is the way that God has ordained it. Look, I didn't read the Bible. I didn't write the Bible. I read the Bible many times. I didn't, I didn't write the Bible. That's what it says. And this is the New Testament. This is the way that churches are supposed to be operating. First Timothy chapter two says the exact same thing. We have two witnesses here about how the church ought to be run. 1 Corinthians 14 is one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So should we have women up here and teaching the congregation and teaching the church? According to the Bible, no, absolutely not. That is not a job that, that women have. That has not been ordained for women to do that. Women pastors are wrong. Women teachers are wrong. Women speaking during the learning time is wrong. 
Women saying amen during the preaching is wrong. It ought not to happen. It says it's a shame. They ought to keep silence. So even voicing your opinion in any way, whether you agree or whether you disagree, the Bible is clear about the women keeping silence in the church. And we don't have that problem here, but um, it's what the Bible says and we need to make sure that we're ready. When you come ready to learn, if you're a woman, just remember, you need to keep silence in the church. We're talking about being prepared for church. Church is important, right? We, there's a lot of reasons we come to church. I've already gone through greeting people and fellowshipping with them. It's important to get to know people, to, to help out the others in the church. It's important to sing the praises unto God. We should all be participating in a congregational singing and not just holding back and saying, well, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that because I don't have a good singing voice or whatever the reason is. Uh, I preach a sermon called The Sacrifice of Praise. We ought to be ready to, to, to lift up your voice and to sing unto God. God gets honored by that. He's glorified by that. We, and the more people, if everybody were singing, that's the less your voice is going to be hear, heard individually anyways um, in a congregation singing. So um, everybody should be singing. Everyone should be lifting up their voice. We need to become ready to hear. We need to come ready to hear so that we can learn. And when it's learning time, um, the Bible teaches here that the women ought to be silenced. We also need to be ready to make changes. We need to be ready to apply what we've heard to our, heart, to our hearts. It's, it's one thing to come to church and you've got your Bible and you listen to everything that's said. But if you go out of here and you leave and, you know, you're not able to, to apply what you've heard to your life, what good is it going to be? You're going to be like a forgetful hearer that seeth himself in a, in a mirror and, and when you go the way, you forgetteth what, what manner of man he was. And um, especially things that apply to you. Now, you may leave church if you're not being fed, if you're not, if you're not hearing anything new, if you're not hearing any learning whatsoever from the Bible. You need to be listening. If you're in a church like that, Come, just really come ready and, and come with your Bible. And if, and if the pastor only goes to one place, hey, do some extra reading when, you know, during that time to, um, to really try to get the point that they're trying to make in context and, and, and learn from it as much as you can. I've learned in many different churches. I, I've been able to go, because when you're ready to learn, when you go with that heart and that desire and you want to hear what this person has to say, you want to hear what this pastor who hopefully has done a lot of study and research and knows the Bible well, I want to hear what they have to say. And I've gone to many churches, some better than others, some that weren't so great, but just about every single one of them I've been able to walk away with something, with some piece of knowledge, with some edification, with something going away Saying, well, you know, I learned something, and that's and that's good, and amen for that. And so, you know, some churches are better than others. Some preachers are, are preaching more truth than others. Um, but whatever your situation, go in and and just be ready to learn. And I don't claim to be the the best preacher in the world by any means, but um, even even the sermons that I preach come ready, listening, and ready to to hear what the Bible says. And, and learn for yourself something that you can make the application for. We're going to see, look at a few verses here and uh, turn if you go to Zechariah chapter 1 in the Old Testament. We're going to see here when we hear God's word, you know, many, many um, places where the Bible tells us that we need to repent. We need to change. We need to change something about ourselves. When you hear God's word preached, you need to make a change. You need to turn and go the direction that God wants you to go. Zechariah chapter 1, verse number 3 says, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. So God's saying, look, don't be like your fathers. The word of God was preached unto them. 
And the Word of God came to them and told them, hey, you need to return from your wickedness. You need to turn from your evil doings. You need to turn unto God. But they didn't listen. He's saying, don't be like them. When you hear God's Word preached, you need to turn. You need, you need to do what's right and, and to get rid of your evil doings. Now, is this talking about salvation? No. You don't have to turn from your evil doings and, and start doing good things in order to be saved. That's a works-based salvation. But if you're coming to church, hopefully you're already saved. You ought to be already saved. That's what a church is, is a congregation of believers, a congregation of the saints. The saints are people who are sanctified. People have already been washed in the blood of Christ. I'm not going to turn away unbelievers, but if they come in, I'm going to try to give them the gospel and get them saved. They're not going to be able to receive God's word the same way that someone who's saved is going to be able to because someone who's saved has the Holy Ghost residing inside them and they ought to be able to understand the words of the Lord. Someone who's unsaved can't understand because they're spiritually discerned. They need to get saved first and then they'll be able to understand what's being preached. And what needs to be being preached oftentimes is sermons about repenting. Sermons about changing our ways, about getting rid of the evil doings that we do in our life whatever they may be. Ezekiel 18, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'll read from you for you from Ezekiel 18 verse 30 says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. People will say, oh, well, see, and, and I don't really want to get into the whole repenting of your sins for salvation. There's, I've preached plenty of times on this subject. Go look up a, a whole bunch of other sermons I've preached on. But we do need to be preaching about repentance from iniquities, from our transgressions. And there's a very important reason why. It says, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. If you're saved today and you're living a life where you're committing iniquity and committing trespasses and breaking God's laws, it will be your ruin. God will judge you for those sins in this lifetime. He will chastise and discipline you, and it could end up being your ruin. For example, if I picked up the bottle and became a drunk, because we all have free will, if I were to go back to that type of a lifestyle of drinking and doing drugs, that would be my ruin. That would be my downfall. That would cause a whole multitude of problems in my life and that would be my ruin. We need to, to be able to repent and turn from those transgressions so that that sin isn't our ruin. So it doesn't ruin our lives. Not so that we could be saved. I'm already saved. I've already been saved. Jesus Christ died and paid for all of my sins when he died on the cross. I have eternal life. Eternal is forever. But I can still bring my life to ruin by not turning from my transgressions, by just going into sin. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 8 says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And he's referring to, in 1 Corinthians, you know, he wrote a pretty stern letter unto the, unto the Corinthians about the sin that was going on in their church. And in 2 Corinthians, he's following it up saying, you know, I made you sorry with that letter. He said, at first... I did repent. He did say, you know, he, he, he was repented that he, that he had sent the letter. But then he decided, no, it was the right thing. And what he's happy about is that, you know, he, he came down on them pretty hard. And he said, look, I've judged as though I've already been there. I don't have to even be there hearing what's going on in that place. I've already judged and it's wicked and you need to take care and deal with this problem and get it out of the church and deal with this wickedness. 
Now, it's not always received well. People get upset. People get sorry. The, the goal of hard preaching isn't just to make you sorry. It isn't to make you sorrowful. It's not to make you sad. We don't preach hard just so that you could be sad. That's not the point. The point is so that you can sorrow unto repentance. It's not just so you could be sad about it and be miserable and just be down on yourself. It's so that you can feel bad about what you've done in order to turn from that, in order to get that wickedness out of your life and to move forward. That's the whole point. But sometimes we need to be abased. We need to be brought low. That sin needs to be hammered on so that we can humble ourselves and turn away from those transgressions and turn back to serving God. And that type of a godly sorrowing that leads to repentance in verse 11, he says, this is great. This is a great type of repentance. This is what we need in the church. You need to be ready to make these changes because look at what it does when, when that godly sort of, of sorrow leads to repentance in verse number 11. He says, it kind of halfway through what carefulness it wrought in you. Now you're being a lot more careful with, with how you're living your life and the things that you do when you serve God. He says, yea, what clearing of yourself. You're getting right with God. You're clearing up your transgressions. He says, yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Now you become more desirous of serving God. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Repentance will get you back in good standing, will get you right with God, and will get you um, in the place where you need to be. You need to come to church ready to repent. You need to be ready to listen, to hear God's word, to, to receive it, and to make the changes in your life. Oftentimes, you're going to hear something that you might not want to hear. But it's for your benefit, for your own good. If it's coming from the Word of God, then it's for your benefit. Revelation chapter 3, turn there real quick, is my last point on repentance in the church and being ready to repent and hear the preaching. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Okay, this is the purpose for repenting. Because if God loves you, and He does if you're saved, God loves you. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten the same way that I love all of my children. And when they break my commandments, when they break my rules, they get, ch they get chastened. They get rebuked. They get disciplined because I love them. And that's what God says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's saying, because I do chastise, because I do discipline, because I rebuke, he says, okay, I want you to be zealous now and repent. Change your ways. Turn from it. Otherwise, you're going to get disciplined. Otherwise, the chastening is coming. You need to be ready to change. And this is a great verse showing that, look, every time the word repent is used, for one, it's not talking about salvation. For two, it's not even always talking about sins. This is a great verse that says, you know, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The Bible doesn't refer, refer to hell as just being a rebuke. This isn't talking about going to hell. This is talking about not receiving a punishment in this lifetime for your sins. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. One more thing we need to be ready to do in the church, besides the fellowshipping and the, um, you know, greeting people and getting to know one another, we also need to be ready to help other people in the church, to help your brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, another very important reason to come to church and to get to know the people. 2 Corinthians, we're going to look at chapter 9. I, I, we looked at this just recently in another sermon. But um, we're going to turn there again. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1 reads, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. 
Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready, lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And, you know, if you weren't able to follow along with that, I preached on this, I'm being a cheerful giver, not too long ago. But um, in this story, he's talking to, um, you know, the church of the Corinthians. He's saying that as touching the ministering to the saints, you know, he's like, I know the forwardness of your mind. And he's boasting to the people in Macedonia. They have a need. And he's saying, oh, yeah, you know what? The church of Corinth, they'll be able to help us out. They'll be able to, to supply your need. I know their heart. They're good people. And I know that they're willing and ready to distribute and they're ready to give. And, um, you know, their zeal to, to do good has provoked many. But he's saying, okay, but I've also sent brethren just in advance letting you know, hey, we're coming and we're going to be asking you to help out and support these people over here that are in some need. So I want you guys to be prepared for that. Now, we ought to be prepared in general. It's a good thing if you can, if you have the means to be prepared to be able to help others out financially or otherwise. In this case, we're talking about financially because he said that he was going to, um, he was letting them know in advance so that they can have their bounty prepared. They could, they could do a collection and gather it and have it ready to go so that when Paul shows up, they'll be ready to go and be like, oh, okay, here you go. We, we've, you know, we, we've, gotten our, our um, goods together, we've gotten our resources together, and here's what we have to help you guys out. And again, coming to church is a place where we all gather together and pitch in to help other people out, to help out other churches in need, to help out other saints in need, and to help out one another within the church. The last point that I'm going to make tonight is preparing your heart to serve God. We need to be prepared when we come to church. We need to be prepared to greet people, to fellowship, to sing, to listen, to learn, to do all these various things. But you need to have your heart prepared. If your heart's not prepared, none of this is going to work for you. Your heart needs to be ready to serve God. First Samuel, turn if you would to First um, Chronicles, chapter number twenty-nine. Turn if you would to First Chronicles twenty-nine. I'll read from you from First Samuel seven three. The Bible says, "And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you." And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So in this instance, you know, Samuel's telling them, telling the children of Israel, prepare your hearts unto God. Get rid of this sin, get rid of these false gods. And if you prepare yourself and, and just get ready to serve God, hey, God will deliver you. He'll step in. He'll be able to, to help you defeat your enemies. You won't have to go through the chastising and disciplining of God. You'll be able to, to have God with you instead of God being against you. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender. And the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. This is talking about when David was preparing this. And this is, if you remember this morning's sermon, David did a lot in preparation for the, for the temple to be built. And we see here in 1 Chronicles 29, he says, the work is great. It's a great work that needs to be done. Hey, there's a great work that's going to be done in church and it's for the Lord God. 
Verse number two says, Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. And he goes on about the gold and for the things of gold and the silver and the wood and the onyx stones and all these various things that he collected. But for us today in the church, hey, you ought to be prepared and prepare your heart with all of your might for the house of God, for, for coming to church. Verse number three says, Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. He's saying that because my affection is so much on this, because I love God so much and I love this work that I'm doing, he said, I've given way more just of my own stuff. I've given of my own time. I've given of my own resources to get this done because... I've set my affection to the house of God. Your affection ought to be on church. Like we said in the beginning, you know, I was happy when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Your affection should be well towards church. It should be something that you look forward to where I can say, hey, I, my life will get better as a result of going to church, as a result of listening to God's word preach, as a result of listening and making new friendships and getting to know people within the church. Hey, that's going to give you an improvement in your life. And you ought to have a good affection towards that. And if your affection is on the things of God and is on coming to church, your affection is going to be impacted towards getting right with God and getting the sin out of your life and doing the right things and being zealous towards doing the great work of helping to build this church and to bring people in and to get people saved. That's where your affection is going to be. And that's where it ought to be. You're in 1 Chronicles. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 12 real quick. Second Chronicles 12 verse 13 says, So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And he did evil, because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Our heart needs to be prepared. This is Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. The Bible says here that Rehoboam ended up doing evil. Because his heart wasn't prepared. Your heart needs to be prepared. You need to be ready when you come to church. You need to be ready to hear. You need to be ready to repent. You need to be ready to serve God. And if you don't, it's just going to lead you down a path to doing evil. If your heart is not prepared and not ready to serve God and to receive His word and to receive His instruction. This is in, in contradiction to Ezra. The Bible says of Ezra, turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That will be the last place I have you turn. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll read from Ezra chapter 7. Ezra was much different than Rehoboam. Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was already scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So Ezra's getting everything that he requested of the king, he's receiving. Because the hand of the Lord God was upon him. God was with him. We're going to see why in a few minutes. Verse 7 says, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. For he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Again, we see that phrase, according to the good hand of his God upon him. All these great things, all these people going with him to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple. This is all this, this was going on because God was with him. Verse number 10, here we see why the good hand of God was upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra's heart was prepared to seek God. It was prepared to learn the laws. He was prepared to teach the laws of God. 
He loved it. And because of that, because his heart was prepared, God was with him. God can either be with you or God could be against you. Your heart needs to be prepared. Your heart needs to be stirred up and ready to receive the word when you come to church. Don't view church as a drudgery. Don't view church as a pain in the neck. You ought to be happy to come. You ought to be happy to hear these great words of wisdom that have been preserved from us from the mouth of God. God's own words for us today. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look down at verse number 15, very famous verse. Verse we have outside on our banner. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor." sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. When you come to church, we need to be prepared unto every good work. There's a lot of good works that we need to do and our heart needs to be ready. We need to be prepared to do the good works. We need to be prepared by reading our Bible, but we need to be prepared um, by learn to, to come to church and to learn and to listen and to, to get to know one another. All these things are very important. Singing praises unto God, hearing the word, listening, receiving, and repenting. Church is important. Girls, church is important. You need to be listening and paying attention when the preaching is going on. This is just as important for you to hear, even more important maybe than everybody else to hear. Don't ever get out of church. The Bible says it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Jesus shed his blood for the church. You need to treat it as something that's a very important part of your life. A place where you can come and learn and fellowship and do all, uh, again, I'm not going to repeat myself over and over again about all the things that we need to do in church. But it is important and we should look forward to it. Look forward to hearing God's word. Look forward to making the changes that we need to make and have our hearts right with God and ready to serve and ready to do the things that he has for us to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, stir up our souls within us. Help us to get our hearts right, to, to not love the things of this world, dear Lord, but to, to love the things of God and um, that we can get to the point to where we truly do love and enjoy coming to church and that we, we wouldn't dream of, of missing it and, and not wanting to be away from it, dear Lord. I, I remember... Um, when, when that spirit was stirred up within me uh, quite a while ago. And um, you've really made a difference in my life. And it really is exciting when, when we get excited about coming to church and, and wanting to serve you and having that zeal and wanting to learn and to grow and um, to do all these things. All these aspects of, our, of the church is so important. And there's so many people today that, that look at church with disdain and think that it's not so important. And, oh, well, I don't need church to be saved. And while that statement alone might be true, yes, but you need church for so many other things, dear Lord. And help us never to forget that and to place church as a very high priority in our lives. And I pray that you would please lead us and guide us into all truth and knowledge and wisdom, dear Lord, and help us to be good judges of, of what is being taught and preached. And um, God, I pray that you would please continue to build our church, help us to grow and to reach more people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.